For much of film history, filmmakers have been using the medium as a way of laying down their political manifesto and sometimes attempting to affect change. You could date this back to D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation, a film which is decidedly not anti-fascist as it famously rewrites the Civil War by placing the Ku Klux Klan as the heroes, but you could also link it to Charlie Chaplin's genius satire The Great Dictator, which should be essential viewing if you've not already seen it. Anyway, today I want to spotlight five absolutely fantastic films that fight against fascism that are definitely worth watching. What about you, son? Infantry, sir. Good for you. Mobile infantry made me the man I am today. First, we have Starship Troopers. Massively misunderstood at the time of its release, Paul Verhoeven's 1997 satirical science fiction film was initially viewed by some critics as a mindless splatterfest, but has since gained the reputation it deserves. The film takes Heinlein's 1959 novel, which could be charitably called reactionary at best, and essentially turns it into a massive joke, starting off fairly subtly but building into basically showing the Federation forces, the supposed good guys, in SS uniforms. The film shows how an authoritarian regime can use methods other than physical coercion to control its population, from the use of propaganda films which are liberally checkered throughout the film, to dehumanizing people and teaching children at a young age that might makes right, to restricting precisely who can vote, which according to some definitely not crypto-fascist online is entirely in keeping with liberal theory. This is some fun and bloody science fiction that's got some great detached irony in it, and one that I highly recommend. Bet there's quite a few of you that didn't expect to see this film here. Pan's Labyrinth's Spanish Civil War setting is not simply window dressing, but the whole centre of the film. Not only diving into the callousness of the nationalist army and the rigidity of the patriarchy that they stand for, but also riddling the protagonist Ophelia's journey throughout the film with a lot of symbolism as each creature she encounters and conquers represents some part of fascist Spain. I don't think I need to tell anyone to watch this film. However, bonus film, if you'd like a great film about the Spanish Civil War that's a little more grounded in reality than the one with the giant toad, then I'd highly recommend Ken Loach's film Land and Freedom, which serves as a great depiction of both the conflict itself and the compromises that some of the left-wing militias had to make. I would take every single man that isn't in this country that's in a uniform in another country where he doesn't belong and bring him back home and take him out of his uniform and put him back in the world. I would take every single prisoner out of their cages and put him back in the world. I would take every single hungry person and feed him. I would take every single rich person and take away their money. I would take every single person that's sick and tired of working jobs like on the auto lines and things like that and just work for years and years for nothing and never getting ahead. Where people in colleges, I had to quit school because I got so fucking paranoid because after Kent State, after Kent State I realized that I could put on a cheerleader sweater and a I Love America pin and the people that were shooting weren't even aiming and it wouldn't do me any good. I could walk out of a classroom and be on my way to lunch and get killed just as easily as I was in the front line of a barricade in a demonstration. Next up we have Punishment Park. I have been wanting to talk about this film ever since I started this channel. It's one of my favourite films, but precious few have seen it. Set in an exaggerated version of Nixon's America, the film follows a group of arrested radicals who are forced to partake in the training exercise for police officers. The film's script was largely improvised, and much of the cast was made up of non-actors, but oh my god, not that you'd be able to tell. The dialogue, particularly in the courtroom scenes, is riveting. The acting, for the most part, impassioned, and the film is shot with such an intensity and realism that you'll find yourself on the edge of your seat for much of the film. It's also worth noting that this may indeed be the first found footage movie. People always cite that as being Cannibal Holocaust, even despite the fact that not all of the film is found footage, but this precedes that by nine years, and I'm pretty damn sure that this is what you'd call found footage. Anyway, I know chances are that most of you watching have not seen this film, so please do. It's a lot easier to find now than it used to be thanks to a relatively recent Blu-ray release, so you have no excuse not to check this one out. Hey, oh, what's the matter? Nothing. 
What's with basic? You look upset, what's it do? Nothing, it's all people picking on me, checking the myth out of me. Oh, mate, you're breaking me out. Come and sit down for five minutes. Why? Yeah, look at them for you know what I mean? That's look what I fucking mean, then. What's your deal? You can see he's upset. Will you behave with a flair yeah, comment? Right, right. Just come on. Five minutes. Just come and have a sit down, mate. But come on. you all just pick on me. Everyone does. Oh, come and sit down, mate. I feel bloody sorry for you. Just come and sit down five minutes. Shane Meadows' kitchen sink masterpiece, This Is England, is a lot of things. It's a beautifully acted drama about growing up in a northern working class community, and the desolation of opportunity that was present in such communities during the Thatcher era. But it also deals with the rise of the far right, and the way that they can exploit feelings of very real grievances to spread their hateful ideology. Showing how nationalist rhetoric can lead to nationalist beliefs, how nationalist beliefs can lead to hatred of those you perceive as others, and how that hatred can lead to very real and very brutal violence. This is a fantastic, gritty, no-holds-barred coming-of-age film, the kind that only British cinema can produce. So if you have not seen this, then this is some essential viewing. At almost 9 hours and 40 minutes long, Masaki Kobayashi's epic The Human Condition is a fairly daunting watch. Following Kaji, a desk worker who's put in charge of a mine in Japanese-occupied Manchuria, the film manages to cover so much and go in so many directions. Released only 14 years after Japanese surrender in World War II, the film asks how, and to what extent, one can be moral when trapped within a totalitarian and imperialist system. Tatsuya Nagadai, as always, absolutely shines in the lead role, and there's real weight and pathos behind the script. The cinematography and directing, especially when it comes to the use of extras, is top-notch. And this is the film that cemented Kobayashi as my favourite Japanese director. So next time you've got nine hours to spare, go and watch this, and then be able to show off to your friends that you sat through a nine hour and 40 minute film from 1950s Japan. Hey everyone, just the uh, regular stuff here. Uh, like the video, share the video, subscribe to the video, all that good stuff. And I just want to say thank you to all my subscribers, all 37 of you. Uh, thanks for actually caring about what I have to say or, or, or just subscribing out of politeness. But uh, thanks anyway. Uh, I'll see you all next time then.